Welcome to Kingmaker. I'm your host, Roosh V, and today's episode is on man's relationship with politics. What level of involvement should men have with politics? That is a question that I have wrestled with for many years. How involved I should get, because there are two sides of, of this coin. The first side is if you choose not to get involved, people who do choose to get involved will now be able to change laws that eventually cause you pain. One example of this is college-age males now have to deal with various uh, yes-means-yes laws that change the definition of what consensual sex is. We also have various affirmative action and sexual harassment laws that have changed the meaning of work, corporate work for men. Um, I get, I've gotten a lot of emails from men who have been fired from their jobs because of an accusation that they made a sexist comment or a bad joke. You can also have changes to the gun laws that affect your ability to defend your home. Uh, we also have Obamacare, which affects men on the lower end of the economic spectrum to where now their health care degrades because of laws that the government has has made. So the popular quote is, you may not care about politics, but politics sure cares about you. And people who are more invested, who are more politically active, can definitely pass laws and policies which affect your quality of life and that of your family and friends as well. The flip side is if you choose to get involved. And the problem with that is that your life now becomes about the political. It is no longer your, your life in the sense that you're now focused on changing the world. You're focused on changing the minds of millions of people. You're focused on controlling how people behave in the way that you believe is right. And this is a more grasping way to live where your life is more full of tension and trying and Machiavellianism. It's, it's not fun because your entire existence now becomes centered around changing other people. It's also centered around the people who stand against you. So now your life and your behavior is framed by the enemies that oppose you and the change that you are trying to activate. And of course, those special interest groups too. So now, when you start to get involved in politics, your life goes from being about your life and the good that you want to making change and fighting against people who want to prevent you from making that change. So we have two sides of this, this coin. And what is the true answer. How involved should we get to where, at least at the minimum, we are prevented from being harmed by people who are ultra-politically active, but at the same time, we don't sacrifice our own lives just to prevent these people from passing laws that eventually harm us. My political awakening happened in March of 2012. When after many years of teaching men how to improve their sex lives through books I've written and through my main blog, I was put on a list by the Jewish-operated Southern Poverty Law Center. They made a list called the misogynist list, like the biggest misogynist in the entire world. And I think I was near the top of that list. It said that I was a misogynist and hateful towards women. I hate them. And uh, this also included a couple of, a couple of other men in the Manosphere who uh, got freaked out by this list and immediately shut their blogs down because the Southern Poverty Law Center actually works with the FBI to determine threats to the government, threats to certain groups. So this, is, this wasn't a minor thing, and I was shaken up. Because I knew that sharing advice for men when it came to the true nature of women, when it came to how to accomplish consensual sex, was putting me on the path of no return. Here is what I said about that event after it happened. Quote, 
It is clear that gender hate is now a one-way street. Men can hate women, but not the other way around. Men can rape, women can't. Men can be abusive, both physically and emotionally, but women can't. Men can be misogynist, but women can be misandrous, a word that is unknown to most of the American population. Men can be described as lazy slobs who play video games all day, but women are perfect as is in a country where there are organizations trying to convince you that being fat is both healthy and beautiful. Male teachers get sent to pound me in the ass prison if they have sex with a student, but female teachers only get a slap on the wrist. If you're a man, you're likely a perpetrator of hate, violence, and abuse to innocent American women, even if you don't yet realize your thought crime, but never the other way around. End quote. As I got drawn into political debates, starting with my inclusion on the Southern Poverty List, I became a useful idiot in some ways, a punching bag, a symbol for misogyny, for the ultra misogynist man of the United States. And I didn't see it at the time. At the time, I was thinking, well, I'm getting a lot of attention. I'm getting a lot of press coverage. And because of this, my name is getting out there. My ego, I can admit now, loved every single news article that my name was mentioned in. And at the same time, I felt like the fight was coming. This was a fight now. This, my enemy was becoming clear. It was becoming organizations such as the Southern Poverty Law Center. It was becoming the media who I noticed before this, I didn't, but I noticed how they're just taking quotes I've said out of context or outright lying. And this would get worse as the years would go on. And then I began to notice that The feminist who is basically preaching that women need rights and equality and they shouldn't stay at home and cook all day because that's slavery, they kind of started to morph into this new monstrosity called the social justice warrior. And they were a radical leftist that these fat feminists were getting swallowed up by. So their movement, their cause was getting more extreme as the years after 2012 were going on. At this time, I started to believe that if I didn't fight back against these people who were actively trying to censor me, they would win and my life would be ruined in some way. They would take my site off the internet. They would pass more damaging laws against men that would basically make the idea of consensual sex whatever the woman thinks it is, based on what she feels. So my writing became more political because it just felt like the just and logical thing to do. I felt righteous in what I was doing. I was fighting back against this evil, against these really oppressive people who are trying to distort what masculinity is and trying to just kill it outright, trying to convert all men to basically limp-wristed faggots. And I saw that, and I started to see what they were teaching my younger brothers who were in public school, and I had to put my foot down. I had to fight back against this. So I wrote a big article, and this article was called What is a Social Justice Warrior? And it was really widely shared and influential in bringing awareness to these budding leftist activists who were becoming more radical by the year. And let me share a quote from that from that article. Social justice warriors believe in an extreme left-wing ideology that combines feminism, progressivism, and political correctness into a totalitarian system that attempts to censor speech and promote fringe lifestyles while actively discriminating against men, particularly white men. They are the internet activist arm of Western progressivism that acts as a vigilante group to ensure compliance and homogeny of far-left thought." End quote. The true definition of a social justice warrior, SJW, is up for debate, but most generally it has become a catch-all term that describes feminists and liberals who actively try to solve the perceived injustices of modern society by organizing in online communities to disseminate propaganda, to censor speech, 
to punish individuals by getting them terminated for their employment, by actually taking their daily bread away from them simply because they possess an opinion that they don't like. Uh, they also have been successful at positioning themselves in the upper ranks of all universities, all media organizations, all tech companies in Silicon Valley, all Fortune 500, five, Fortune 500 companies. And it almost feels like for me, from going from a man who just wanted to get laid to now there is this, there's multiple institutions that are harboring and protecting this class of SJWs, I felt like I woke up in some kind of nightmare. Like, how did this happen? I just, I was having some fun here. I was in Washington, D.C., just going out and banging sluts and writing about it in a fun way. Not in a way, I wasn't trying to change the world by writing bang. I just wanted to share what I know, make a couple bucks, and just have a good time. And then I wake up, in 2012 and then the years after, finding myself on the wrong side of a war that seemed to be escalating very rapidly. Like often is the case in life, one door tends to lead to another door and another door. So looking into SJWs led me to the actions of the billionaire elite class and how it was them who was supporting the SJWs, how the people at the Fortune 500 companies that I mentioned, people in politics, they were the ones who were enabling these freaks, these people who wanted to shut us down and redefine what sex and masculinity is, that were ultimately responsible for everything that was going on. So earlier I said that I kind of was a useful idiot. I was a punching bag of the left by the real useful idiots of the billionaire class. And they came out in force when I did my Canadian stops of my lecture tour in 2015. Now, as you already know from uh, the story which I wrote in my book, Free Speech Isn't Free, I survived those attacks in Canada uh, in February 2016, they bruised me a little bit more with the meetup out outrage, and that made it very apparent to me that SJWs, the local political class of mayors, and the media all worked together in concert to destroy me, to break me down. And if you trace the sponsors and the owners of those three groups, it all goes up to the billionaire elites. It may be hard to believe that a Black Lives activist protester and a feminist who believes in body positivity and a Antifa who is the anti-fascist anarchist groups who are definitely fascist. It's hard to believe that those three groups who hate the, the establishment supposedly are actually a part of it. They are a part of the establishment and they're getting their money and they're getting positive press co coverage and they are getting enabled by the local politicians in their cities, all stemming from the billionaire class. And that's what I found out because whenever an enemy attacks you, he is forced to reveal his weapons against you. And when he reveals what his weapons are, you can understand him. And the only requirement to really learn how the enemy works is to survive the attack that they put upon you. So this is how I was able to put together that the truth of the matter is that the Foot soldiers on the ground, the SJWs, and including some other fringe groups on the left, the way they get support is help from the really rich, from the richest members of Western society. And once you understand that, it all makes sense why they appear really strong, even though individually, when you isolate them and look at them, they are extremely weak. Most of these people have mental illnesses. Most of them, their bodies are in a state of degradation. They are not strong. They don't lift. Uh, their talking points are basically copy and paste from the universities, who, which the curriculums 
are dumbed down, especially in the liberal arts and the non-STEM majors, or they just directly get their knowledge, their um, their facts, in quote, uh, from the media, who we know the prime purveyors of fake news, just utter bullshit. I mean, the media is really a more mythical, it seems, than Hollywood. So you begin to understand all that, and then you take a step and say, wow, this is a battle that is bigger than I thought. It's, it's not just against a feminist with green hair. It's against George Soros. It's against Mark Zuckerberg. It's against Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. It's against all of them who, through their massive accumulation of capital, is really able to divert a lot of money into these pet causes, these really these causes that breed a lot of chaos in a society with the sole goal for them to retain their power and increase their wealth. It's at that point where I realize huh, I'm going to need a bigger gun. You know, I'm going to need a little bit more than a blog. But then you have a man like Donald Trump come and he is the physical embodiment of all this frustration and anger that those who are not on the fringe left have who understand what is going on and seemingly from with no political experience he was able to win because he harnessed a lot of people who know what's going on and who is angry at it so instead of the average american voter going on the street to yell at a green-haired feminist they just pull the lever in the voting booth for a man named Donald Trump, and that's how they get their payback. One thing I noticed in my battles with the left since 2012 is that as much as I affect them, they affect me as well, and they are changing me at the same time that I change them. The first way that the enemy begins changing me is I'm starting to use their tactics against themselves. So the way that the media can frame a narrative, the way they write their headlines, the way they send out their propaganda onto the internet, I've basically copied that. I have a site, returnofkings.com, which definitely mimics to a certain degree what the mainstream does. So right there, I've become like them just from the flip side, from a different perspective. Secondly, I start to obsess about the enemy and how to beat them. I start to think and think, how can I take these people down? How can I hurt them? And what's, what starts to happen is I'm devoting a larger amount of my personal life into them. So they're getting a greater, greater percentage of my daily activities. And then they what this leads to is I'm starting to get purpose and meaning from them. I'm starting to, my life is now about defeating them. So they have given, a, they're like a device now. They are a thing that must be stopped and my life becomes about stopping them. And then in the last stage, if you keep going, you become your enemy. You become that which you are trying to to fight in at least in the sense that without them you don't know what to do because now you've structured your life to defeat them and now you need them you need them because if they're not there if they're not there to give you this fight then what are you going to do so at least with me i felt that my existence was at least indirectly shaped by those who absolutely hated me and now I drove their behavior when I would write a certain article that they didn't like or when I did a lecture event or a meetup. But their reaction to it then shaped what I was doing, shaped my own behavior. So we were now becoming linked to where my behavior shaped them and their behavior shaped me. And this is how you become what you eventually Fight. And I think a quote from Nietzsche was, um, if you fight monsters, you also become a monster. So my fight carried on into 2016. Donald Trump came on, on the scene. And in him, I saw a man who was really opposed 
uh, to all the enemies that opposed me. So it was a logical decision to support him. And I didn't, I still don't believe that he will ever attack men in the same way that the left has. So I weaponized all my sites and platforms to spread support for him. And that includes the forum, my blog, Return of Kings, my Twitter, my YouTube. And I shared as clearly as I could why Trump should win and why he must win. And he did win. I can't take credit for it, of course, but I hope I helped him at least get a few thousand extra votes, at least for the fact that he triggered basically everyone who actually hates me. And I can't describe what a great victory lap it was to, to say that my guy won. And all the people on the left who believed in the end of history that we got and neoliberalism is going to win forever, for them to be dealt such a devastating defeat was really satisfying for me. Maybe it was even better than sex. So Donald Trump won. Now what? What is the game plan, the political game plan from here? Before I explain my intended course of action, let me ask you three questions. Question number one, can the powers of the state overcome the ingenuity and creativity of a single man? Question number two, can a monolithic government or bureaucracy outwit a man who greatly values his freedom? And question number three, does any unjust law destroy the will of a moral man? I think you know the intended answers for these three questions, because the second an oppressive government or law comes into being, men begin to outwit it, not through direct resistance, not through violent confrontation, which is always an option on the table, but by going around it. Maybe they choose not to comply and they get away with it or they find loopholes. But I firmly believe that there are no rules, no law, no rigid body that can put a plug, that can stop the breathing, moving, thinking, fluid masses of masculine men. No matter what law they come up with, no matter what myth they try to invent, there are ways around it that only rely on individual action, that don't require political action. If you decide not to get politically involved at all, and you see that the state, that the culture is coming down on you, if you sit and think, if you calculate what all of your options are, I am confident that you will still, in spite of being outnumbered a billion to one, still be, be able to find a way out without getting politically involved. Let me give you a few examples of how this could work. For the first example, I'll refer back to Canada. I tried to do speeches that were viciously protested. I mean, there was thousands and thousands of people online. Mayors got involved. And they really needed a venue to attack head on. They needed a fixed target. So what did I do? I didn't give them one. I operated on the basis of concealment. I hid the venue from them and only told the venue of people who bought a ticket to see the lecture. So I worked around them. And as you know, I successfully held them. They, how are they going to stop me in a huge city? You know, what are they going to do? They try to call every single ho uh, hotel possible. They actually tried that, <laughs> but they, they still failed anyway because I was able with the men and also with the protocol that I devised to screen out any SJW who may have slid in and bought a ticket. I've, I thought of a way to keep them out, and I, I did. I didn't need political action. I didn't need a law on my side. I didn't need a mayor on my side. And through the ingenuity of man, through from the men that were with me and through myself, we were able to defeat them even though we were vastly outnumbered. For a second example, let's imagine a divorced man. He just got divorced and his wife is going to take him to the cleaners. She is really, she wants everything. And he's about to get raped in the family courts. 
But let's say that he sets up a corporation, sends his wages to that corporation, writes off the living expenses from the corporation, and then pays himself a very small wage. And that wage, which he pays himself from the corporation to himself, is then liable for whatever alimony or payment that his ex-wife has to has to get. But since he's already writing off a lot of the living expenses as maybe a business expense with the corporation, the alimony that he does have to pay is way smaller than what he would have have actually paid. So let's say that his salary every year is $100,000 and the judge orders him to pay, let's say, 30, 30% of what his income is. So he has to pay her $30,000 every year. But let's say that now he pays himself from the corporation only $40,000 every year. And now 30% of that is $12,000. So he's working around the, around the system, around the unjust court order to, I mean, you can call it cheating, you can call it illegal, I'm not even sure of it, but there is a way, and this man, he probably, I mean, unless he is a millionaire, a billionaire, he's going to get away with it. Let's use a third example of a man in college who meets a girl who is majoring in gender studies, and she is obsessed with rape. Just she can't stop thinking about it. She thinks that women in the United States are raped at a rate 10 times higher than in the slums of South Africa. So she is looking. She's looking for that case. Oh, I'm going to show men. Men are evil. They are abusive. I'm going to get one of them. And But this man has a $100 camera in his room that is motion activated and it records a consensual sex encounter. Now he is going to be immune from the accusations and with more and more men accused of uh, rape and sexual harassment, this accusation will no longer be enough to destroy him completely. So he, with this $100 camera, has worked around this rape culture narrative, which is sponsored by basically all the universities and the media, and he did it with something that was extremely cheap. And in a fourth example, even a man who lived in Stalinist Russian times, let's say he knows that making a joke against Stalin will lead him to being dragged off to the gulags. So what does he do? I mean, is it worth it for him to protest at his work, to protest in a store, to make that joke or not? Well, if he wants to be politically activated, if he wants to make a point, hey, he is free to do so. But if he wants to avoid being sent to the gulag because he doesn't want to go there, all he has to do is self-censor himself for that particular joke, say it to himself, with the satisfaction that all regimes are transitory anyway, that the pendulum will swing back to freedom. So some people may not like this idea. I shouldn't have to self-censor. You are right. You are completely right. It is wrong. But if we know what the cost is, now at least we can choose. Because if you didn't know that you weren't allowed to make a joke and you made that made that joke, I could understand the plight that you were in. But if you knew what the consequences are and you wanted to offer a direct form of resistance against this type of culture, you have to understand that at least, you know, you know what you were getting into. When water encounters a barrier, what does it do? It goes around it. It simply goes around it or it dams itself, waits until enough water builds, the pressure is building, it's building, and then boom, the barrier collapses from the weakness of all the weight of the water. Now, because the entities that we stand up against, at least up to the election of Donald Trump, is so much more powerful than us and are basically outnumbered us in the, in the perspective of how politically active the left is compared to the political right, I am in the belief that we must act like water. We go around the barriers that we are facing 
we find loopholes, we find safeguards, we find an ironic way to exhibit our true speech, or we simply conceal it. So our enemy does not know where we are, and they do not have a way to attack us until the moment is right for us to offer more of a direct confrontation. Now, I wouldn't shame the man who believes in direct resistance. If he believes that he is fight, fighting a righteous crusade against an evil left who is trying to normalize pedophilia, who is trying to change the very nature of the sexes, who is trying to change the definition of tradition and marriage, I would not shame him. But direct confrontation is violent and all-consuming. The very act of direct resistance turns you into what you're resisting. So you become the enemy, or at least you're defined by it, because your direct resistance will soon be giving you purpose and meaning to where without the enemy, without the fight, you won't really know how to live. And I decided that this is not how I want to live my life. This is not why I live the way I do, simply to fight against degenerate freaks. So what is the kingmaker strategy? What is the ideal balance of how involved, politically involved men should get? Now, in April of 2016, on my blog, I wrote an article called The Resistance Pyramid, where I describe a resistance strategy that is mostly indirect, but also gives you room for direct resistance if the situation calls for it. There are five steps. The first step, and the one that most men should start with, is individual improvement to prepare his strength and to learn how to face his fears and anxieties with the goal to be stronger than the enemy that he believes he will one day face. So this is our general path of self-improvement, of, of at least trying to reach the potential and the goals that we believe that we are capable of. The second step is financial resilience. Now, the easiest way for the modern enemy to get you is through your job, to take away your income to take away your daily bread, especially if you have a corporate job. So the goal here in the second step of the resistance pyramid is to try and achieve multiple streams of income, a cell phone business, or at least a stock savings account so that if they do cause you to lose your job, you won't be out on the streets within a, a month. The third step of the resistance pyramid is global information warfare. And this basically translates a fancy way of saying to spread the truth, but only to people who want the, the truth. Because if you try to spread the truth to people who believe in lies and want to continue believing in lies, they will attack you and they will try to destroy you. It's kind of like trying to give girl advice to a man who doesn't want girl advice, who didn't ask you. He's going to resent you and sell you out. And I learned this the hard way when I was younger. So do not try to enlighten or help people who don't want it. Because if you do, even if you're just giving them a basic fact that you think will help them, if they are immune to facts and haven't shown you any indication that they're looking for what the truth is, that they have any doubt to what the narrative is, this person is probably going to become your number one enemy. The fourth step of the resistance pyramid is tribal organization. You need to create a circle of local men, men who live near you, who you trust and who you can count on. Now, I tried to do that with the February 2016 outrage and they came down on me hard. They definitely tried to stop that because they know it's such a critical step for men to increase their strength by bonding with other men who are strong as well, because one man alone can be defeated much more easily than a group of men who bind together and fight as a, cohe a fight as a cohesive unit against unjust authority. The four steps I talked about so far are really indirect resistance because it's 
mostly focusing on you and your environment. It is not directly walking up to someone who you believe is the enemy and fighting them. It's basically a preparation step. It's to prepare you for bad times while increasing your your strength and your options too. So this is the be like water analogy which I gave earlier. But then we have the fifth step of the resistance pyramid. And this is local resistance with your tribe and self-defense. If you, your family, and or your tribesmen are under direct attack that includes physical threats and violence, I believe this is now the time where you must resist with everything you you have because it's at the point where if you don't, your life and the lives of those around you could be at, at stake. So at this stage, you are resisting and confronting directly the enemy because you have no other, no other choice and there is no way to go around the enemy. Maybe they're going to take things that you own, overwhelm your land or um, house, destroy your business utterly so you have maybe no way of earning an income in the future. Um, now, because they are so close to you, even maybe barring your doors will not actually help you. So this is when I would say we are now in a justified self-defense situation and we can actively fight back with all the means that we have available to us. To really understand how to resist, we have to ask ourselves what the purpose of our lives are. And that's a hard question, but at least you can start in what the purpose is not. And for me, the purpose of my life is not every day interacting with crazy leftists or anarchists or getting into street battles with them. It's not shouting down people. It's not trying to convince idiots. And so, you know, these people, they may gain more political power, but I will be like water against them. I will swat away their silly laws and programs. I will find loopholes because I am smarter than them. And I will find a way around the nonsense that they try to push in the government locally or federally. And I will laugh at them and just be smarter than them because I see the value of indirect resistance, of not being harmed by them, but still being able to live the life that I want. But if they come to my door and try to take my life or the lives of my family, I will chop them up into little pieces. So if it is within your nature to be a politician, then so so be it. I don't think any man should ignore what his nature calls for, especially if he just maybe his he had a childhood that was kind of rough and that instilled this constant need to fight. And if he needs to fight, then maybe politics is good or trying to influence the narrative in some way on the daily news cycle is good. But it is not good for a man such as myself who just wants to every day think and sit and write and bake bread when I need bread and make really delicious cups of homemade coffee. So that is more a more fulfilling life for me that matches my nature than being poli than being politically active and getting into the political sphere not only was unsatisfying wholly unfulfilling but it almost got my family killed so i can see i don't want to run away from an enemy but at the same time, I have to accept that I didn't even want that in the first place. I just wanted, I didn't want to directly confront them, but they were so bored and so stupid that they were looking for a, a fight and I was the most useful punching bag that they actually found. I look at the events of what happened in Canada and what happened in February 2016 as one big unnecessary distraction. And it had, it was so big. It was such a huge event in my life that you probably noticed I refer to it a lot. And it's not because I get enjoyment from talking about it, but because it was such a big deal. And this is 
a danger. Like my life was starting to be shaped by these big events, these attacks that were from that were coming from the left. So when I saw that, when I saw that, okay, the highlight of my year was almost getting destroyed. <laughs> you know, I started to wonder, is this what I want? Because if I kept going, you can probably imagine that every year there's going to be some way I'm going to do an event or something in public, and this whole scene will replay itself. And that's not the type of life that I want to live. There is still, even if you don't want to get politically active, there is one requirement that you can't really avoid, and that is to stay well informed. You need to know what the new laws are. You need to know how women are screwing men with false accusations, with uh, really bad divorce courts, uh, family courts. Uh, you need to know which political candidate to vote for. Of course, that opens the argument of voting matters or not. But I think in the case of Trump, Trump being in the White House is definitely a better outcome for all of us than Hillary Clinton. And we have to at least know what is going on. So you can't close your eyes com completely. You have to be an informed citizen, at least with local politics. And if you're involved out there chasing girls and you want to get married or something, you need to know what is going, what is happening to most men who are embarking on the same journey, who are doing similar things that you are doing. And the more informed you are, the more you can come up with indirect means of resistance where you won't be negatively impacted as much by some of the crazy stuff that is has already happened to a lot of other men. Now that Trump has won, I believe we have a ship captain who is not going to steer the ship directly to an iceberg. So I can relax. No more politics for me, or at least the most minimum of it possible. I will stay informed. I will see what is going on, but I trust trust this ship captain to hire the right first mate, to hire the right staff to steer that ship at least in a better way than how it has been steered for the past 10, 20 years. I feel like finally I can live my life again to recapture the purpose that was in some ways robbed from me when the establishment started to attack me in 2012. One, one where my path really went a direction that seemed right at the time, seemed satisfying from an ego perspective that, look, I'm being more known, but ultimately was one that was defined by my enemies instead of myself. And if the tension increases in the air again, and I see a candidate or a movement that I believe will not attack men, I'll be sure to support them. And I'll be sure to tell other men who listen to me to support them as well. But beyond that, I can just say how happy I am to sit on the deck of the poolside deck of this big ship and not have to worry where it is it is going but if i i will keep my eyes open and if i see an iceberg up ahead i will bang on the captain's door and say captain we are headed directly for that big ass iceberg so please turn the ship in another way or maybe we can find another captain on this ship who can do a better job i'd like to end this podcast with a simple story the other weekend, I went to the hardware store because I have a slow bathroom drain that I had to to fix. So I went to the hardware store. I bought a couple of things. And in the hardware store, I browsed through the garden. And I was looking for any plants that maybe I can add to my house. I already have two of them. And I didn't see anything interesting. But then my eye caught a bonsai tree. And this is the Japanese tree a uh, type of, of plant where it's a miniature tree. It looks like a miniature tree in a ceramic type of pot. And it was only eight inches tall. And the foliage on top of this bonsai tree was very sparse, but it had a strong trunk going into tightly packed soil. 
and the the design of the ceramic pot looked good too. So, but I didn't buy it, and I continued on. I bought some other things for my apartment, some exciting things like light bulbs. But this image of the bonsai tree got stuck in my head because even though it was really small, I knew from what I know about bonsai trees is that it took years for it to get to its current sellable state because even though it is small, it still takes almost as much time as a full-size tree to be developed. So I went back to the tree and I decided to examine it a little bit closer. And I picked it up, I looked at it from multiple different angles, and something clicked in me. I, next thing I know, I am cradling this bonsai tree like a baby, and I bought it. And it's actually sitting right beside me as I do this podcast. And I look at it every day, and I feel really peaceful when I, I do, because... It's almost as if the tree has seen so much, but it does not care about what's going on on the outside. It does not worry itself about the swinging pendulum of man from going to one political extreme to the next and the various machinations of the billionaires and the rich people and the foot soldiers on the on the bottom it doesn't care and it will die one day as gracefully as it came into being no worries just existence just day to day enjoying what the earth what nature's bounty has given to it and i hope that my at least temporary removal from politics will give me this very same nature as the bonsai tree to where I can ignore the petty bickering and childishness of the political realm of not being defined by really crazy mentally ill people of the left and just focus on living my own life as I see fit. So thank you for listening to this podcast. If you like it, please leave a rating on iTunes. Uh, share it with a friend and drop me an email at rush at rushv.com to let me know how men should approach politics. Until next time.